Um, okay, so before we move on to solve for the temporal or time-dependent part of the classical wave equation, let's solve another differential equation um, that has a slightly different form. So in this differential equation, um, I have an omega squared. This, this term, this Greek letter is called omega. So I have an omega squared, um, and instead of having y as a function of t, I have x as a function of t, meaning that um, you know the spatial part, x, depends on time t. So I just made a note here that the independent variable here is t, and the dependent variable is x. So the value of x depends on the value of t. So as time goes on, the value of x changes, okay? So whenever we write, um, whenever we write independent and dependent variables, we do it in this format. So the dependent variable is outside of the bracket and the independent variable is inside of the bracket. So here um, we're used to seeing f as a function of x usually. Here things have kind of been modified such that we have x as a function of t. So anyways, we have our parent equation um, and we're told that the initial conditions, um, initial condition is just a fancy name for boundary conditions, um, at when x um, x at 0, so when t is equal to 0, the value of x is just a, and then the rate of change of x um, with respect to t is 0 when time is 0. So that means when you just start your stopwatch, when you're looking at the system, like, you know, at 0, uh, the rate of change of x is 0. So this is an ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients, um, and it's equal to 0. That means like we've done before, that the solution of x of t has to be in the form e to the exponent alpha t, where alpha must be determined. So the parent equation is, of course, this guy. Um, and we know that the solution is in this form. It's e to the exponent alpha t. So instead of x as a function of t, we're going to substitute its solution in the parent equation. So when I do that, I'm left with this equation. Okay, so I have to take the derivative of e to the exponent alpha t twice, um, and then everything else is just in algebraic form. There's no need to do anything else to this term. So if I take the derivative of e to the exponent alpha t once, I'm left with e to the exponent alpha t, and then remember, you have to take the derivative of the exponent, that's the chain rule. So the exponent of alpha t is just alpha, because t here is our variable. So this thing stays the same, there's no operators acting on it. Um, if I do the derivative of GAN, I'm left with alpha squared e to the exponent alpha t. If I divide this whole equation by e to the exponent alpha t, I'm left with alpha squared plus omega squared is equal to zero. If I move omega to the other side, it becomes negative omega squared. So if I square root that, remember the square root of a negative term is i, So I'll, um, and the square root of omega squared is just omega. So, this, so I'm left with positive negative i omega. So that means, um, you know, x of t has two solutions, but the most general solution is a linear combination of both of the solutions. So therefore, the most general solution is just c1 e to the exponent positive i omega t plus c2 e to the exponent negative i omega t. So this is the most general form, most general solution. This is the solution we're interested in, and this is the solution we'll, we'll try to work with. Um, omega is a constant. I know the value of i. I know that t is a independent variable, so I'll be given its value usually. So I don't really know what the value of c1 and c2 is. In order to get their values, I have to subject this equation to the boundary conditions or the initial conditions. So remember, the initial conditions, um, they were these guys, that x at 0 is equal to a, and that the rate of change of x is equal to 0 when time is equal to 0. Okay. So I want to remind you quickly that Euler's formula um, is, is a way that helps us convert Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. So remember, Euler's formula is this guy over here. 
Um, and I also said that we'll be working with Euler's formula a lot more than the Cartesian coordinates. So we're going to go ahead and convert this into, um, you know, the polar representations. So you have to remember that omega, or sorry, that um, del, or I mean theta here is equal to omega t because if you draw the parallel, well, i is this guy, therefore omega t must be theta. Okay, so theta is equal to omega t, we know that much. So then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to convert um, x of t from its Cartesian coordinates into x of t in its polar coordinates. So um, instead of this e to the exponent i omega t, I go ahead and I put in Euler's formula. And I do the same thing for the second e term. So remember, the first e term has a positive sign, so that's what I get here. The second e term has a negative sign, and that's what I'm left with over here. I'm going to go ahead and distribute the c inward, and same with c2. So um, when I do that, I'm going to bring all the cos terms together and all the sine terms together. Okay, so here c1 and c2, um, they'll add with each other because cos omega t is a, is a factor, it's a common factor, so you can pull that out. So I do the same with the second sine term, and I'm left with this equation over here. So c1 plus c2, it's going to equal to another constant, right? c1 could be 1, c2 could be 2. Well, in the end, 1 plus 2 is 3, so it's, it's also another constant. So I'm going to call that constant, um, you know, c3. And same for this guy over here. This constant, I'm going to call it c4. There's no point in writing this long equation, you know, all the time. Whenever we can simplify things, we should simplify things to make life easier. So the polar representation is simply c3 cos omega t plus c4 sine omega t. Now remember, the polar representation is the same thing as the Cartesian representation is just it's a different way of representing the same thing. Okay, so that's just what I um, wrote over here, that the Cartesian and the polar representations, they're equivalent, they're just different ways of writing the same thing. Okay, and the important thing is we'll work with polar forms mostly, it makes calculations a lot easier. You might be asking yourself, well, if they're the same thing, why do we have to convert them? Um, the answer is we convert them because you know, subsequent calculations are a lot easier to do. Um, most of you have worked with cos and sine throughout your high school and university careers, um, but, you know, um, uh, exponent terms are not really that used to solving equations using exponent terms. So it's best to simplify things to, to a form that you're most used to seeing. Okay, so now we have to find c3 and c4. We'll subject um, our parent equation, or we'll subject our um, x of t equation to the boundary conditions and we'll try to figure out what c3 and c4 is. Well, I know that when x is equal to, um, when t is equal to 0, then x of t is equal to a. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to replace 0 with every t that I find. Okay, so then I do that in this equation um, and I know that cos of 0 is just 1. And the sine of 0 is just 0. So that leaves me with the fact that C3 is just equal to A. So now I know what C3 is. It's equal to A. So then I know the second boundary condition that the rate of change of x with respect to t is equal to 0 when t is equal to 0. So first I have to find the derivative of um, x with respect to t, then whenever I see a t, I'm going to substitute it with 0, and then I'm going to say that the whole equation is equal to 0. Now, that kind of might seem confusing right now, but here's what I mean. So first, I take the derivative with respect to t, okay? So remember, the derivative of cos theta um, is just negative sine theta, but here we don't have theta, we have omega t, we have two terms, so we have, to we have to use the chain rule. So when I use the chain rule, it's the outside derivative, which is this guy, multiplied by the inside derivative, which is this guy. So the outside derivative is just negative sine omega t. 
the inside derivative, meaning the derivative inside of the bracket um, of omega t is just omega. So that's why I get negative c3 omega sine omega t plus c4. Remember now the derivative of the outside of sine omega t is just cos omega t. But then the derivative of the inside term is just omega. So that's where I get this term from. Now remember, it's equal to 0 when t is equal to 0. So I'm going to put 0 in place of all of these t's. Um, remember, sine of 0 is just 0, and the 0 cos of 0 is 1. That means that c4 times omega is equal to 0, or c4 is equal to 0. Okay? So I know that c3 is equal to a and c4 is equal to 0. That means this whole term is equal to 0. Okay, so if you don't understand how to take derivatives um, involving the chain rule, leave it in the comment section and I'll do a video explaining that as well. So, x of t is just equal to a cos omega t because the other term um, with the c4, it just becomes 0 because anything multiplied by 0 is equal to 0. So x of t, I know what it is. So that means that the solution to this differential equation, it has a cos term in it, meaning that this solution is kind of like a wave, because remember, cos represents a wave, sine represents a wave. So this is a called an oscillatory solution. This solution oscillates in time, meaning it goes up and down, up and down, up and down over time. Um, and it shouldn't be too surprising to you, but I thought I'd write this down, that some differential equations have oscillatory solutions, okay? So if I plot a cos omega t, this is what I get. The amplitude of this wave is a, okay? So this is the amplitude. So that means the height of the wave goes from positive a to negative a, okay? Um, and then it, then it fluctuates with some frequency, right? So it fluctuates with some frequency and some period. I know that this is one wavelength from here till, you know, this point, this point over here, this is one wavelength. I know the wavelength. Um, but here's a side note. How do I find the linear frequency if I know the angular frequency omega? Right? Um, so what I do is, I know that, sorry, this is an angular frequency, this is angular velocity, I don't know what I was thinking, um, angular velocity omega. Okay, so the angular speed or angular velocity, I know that, but I want to find out the linear frequency, I want to find out what's the frequency with which this wave repeats itself. Well, let's consider a simple fact. Speed is equal to distance over time. We all know that. So angular speed is equal to angular distance covered over time. Um, but whenever we're talking about you know cyclic systems, instead of time, I have something called a period. So consider a circle. And imagine that you're standing over here at this point. If you go around the circle once, What's the total distance that you cover in terms of angles? Well, the total distance that you cover in terms of angles is just 360 degrees, or 2 pi radian. So that's where the angular distance 2 pi comes from. And the time it takes for you to cross that circle once, um, it's called a period, right? It's called your period. Um, so t, um, is, your, is the period of this system and omega is equal to 2 pi over t. Remember, 1 over t is just equal to the frequency f, um, but a more scientific way of representing frequency is this fancy Greek symbol nu. Okay? So omega is just equal to 2 pi nu or 2 pi frequency. So if I know 
that omega is equal to 2 pi nu, then this frequency, this linear frequency, is simply equal to omega over 2 pi. So this was an aside. Uh, I'll do it again when we need it, but I thought that I'd introduce you to this concept right now. Um, we'll need it further on in our discussion of quantum mechanics, but I thought I'd drive this simple relation right now. So the linear frequency is connected to the angular velocity by this relationship. 